Well, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to Grand Rounds in 2021. So starting in 2021, we're broadcasting this live and also recording it for those of you who can't uh, be here today. Um, if you are a New Jersey PT licensee, make sure you're on the live call because uh, you get credit for a live course. Um, and on the recorded car call, you get uh, credit for an asynchronous course. So um, today we have Dr. Patrick McCormick talking to us about exploring vestibular pathology in children. Uh, Dr. McCormick received his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Notre Dame and his doctor of physical therapy degree from the University of Rhode Island. And he's a board certified, he's board certified in neurologic physical therapy and a certified LSVT big clinician. And he practices at the Emmaus facility at St. Luke's uh, University Health Network. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. McCormick. All right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, yes. Yep. Um, so for the past um, 11 years, I've been working as a physical therapist. And for the past uh, five years, I've been working um, exclusively with uh, neuro and pediatric patients. Um, so as part of my work, I frequently see adults with vestibular pathology, um, positional vertigo, hypofunction, subjective visual vertigo, and all those other kind of subjective sequelae that can uh, result from vestibular pathology. Um, I've uh, you know learned from uh, Dr. Ethan Hood. Um, you know, I've gone through an advanced vestibular course and a lot of MedBridge courses and the dizziness and balance website and uh, 50 vestibular uh, special interest group podcasts, which are fantastic. Um, and you know that really has improved my practice with adults. But meanwhile, I was treating uh, children. And I've never had a referral for uh, pediatric vestibular pathology. Um, but meanwhile, I was missing a lot of, of what I now know um, is likely vestibular pathology in, in my uh, kids that I'm seeing. Um, from kids with just simply gross motor delays, to kids who are gravitationally insecure. Um, and it just simply hadn't occurred to me um, how, how prevalent vestibular pathology can be in kids. and whether to, and I wasn't looking for it, so of course I was not finding it. Um, so today I want to weave through as part of um, this presentation, and thank you for being here. Um, I want to weave through a case. Um, the case is uh, my niece. Um, and when we first, my, when my sister in law and me were first talking about it, um, her Lily um, was about four years old. Um, but I want to just, I'll give you some history now, I'll give you some more later, and then some findings and kind of outcomes as we go. Um, but the top row of picture shows um, my niece. Um, she was uh, born full term. Um, no, nothing really um, remarkable in terms of her birth history and even her developmental milestones. She sat up um, and uh, learned to walk at an appropriate age. Um, she started walking at 12 months old. Um, she didn't really do much rolling, but as you see in kind of that picture in the middle there, she would frequently kind of hold herself in a high guard position, even when she was being held by other people. And that was a little bit unusual. That was the first thing that my sister-in-law noticed with her, um, with her development wise. Um, so we'll talk about uh, Lily uh, later on, but I want to kind of keep in mind the couple of the pictures on the bottom there. You know, the kid that has difficulty going up and down stairs when they're five years old and needs a uh, railing or needs some support. Um, the kid who has difficulty ba with balance and falls all over the place. Um, or kids who are just very cautious about life at four and five years old, because we know that most four and five years old, year olds are not all that cautious. Um, so what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, we're going to talk about the vestibular system and how it's important for gaze stabilization and postural stability. Um, and we're going to talk about the incidence of vestibular pathology in children and how it's different from adults um, and how we can start to evaluate and treat vestibular pathology in kids. Um, we're also going to do a little digression 
um, and talk about visual function because visual, visual function in kids is something that we also might not be super familiar with and is intrinsically tied to vestibular function um, and also uh, when to refer for vestibular pathology. Um, so I'd like to start with this quote. Here is by a British author, Roald Dahl. Um, you guys might be familiar with some of his work, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. My apologies, everybody. Um, we had a little tech glitch here. And now we should be good again. OK, so I'm not quite sure where that cut out. Um, but my point with that, that quote is that if we're not looking for something, we're not going to find it. And that certainly applies to my practice um, with pediatric patients. Um, so some caveats in terms of who this is intended for. Um, Kids are really hard to study in general, um, and kids uh, also don't necessarily report dizziness. We know that um, five to six percent of kids are dizzy at any particular time, um, but they're not very good at reporting it. Um, we haven't been looking very long um, at pediatric uh, vestibular pathologies, and even for adults, if you go back 25 or 35 years ago, we were still plugging semicircular canals when people were having positional vertigo. We, we don't do that anymore. So, um, you know, this stuff isn't that old. Um, and some other caveats, again, as I mentioned, I've never received a specific pediatric a referral for a pediatric vestibular pathology. Um, there also, in a lot of cases, there isn't enough depth to this presentation to make you um, actionable with, with some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, and then we're, we're also not going to talk about, you know, some specifics that are good to know in terms of like specificity or sensitivity for, for some of the testing that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so this is meant for therapists, um, whether uh, PT, OT, or speech. Um, some things that we should all be aware of in terms of the kids with imbalance. Um, and also for um, primary care providers, also for adult therapists. Um, so. You know, some of the kids that you might see with a concussion might have a pre-existing ocular motor um, impairment or vestibular impairment. Um, so just very briefly, the vestibular system. Um, the vestibular system does two main things for us, it is gaze stability and postural stability. Um, the sense, it's one of three sensors along with vision and somatosensory information that we use to gather information about our environment and where we are in our environment, our relationship there. Um, it has both static sensors that detect where we are in relationship to gravity, what's up, what's down, and it also has dynamic sensors uh, called semicircular canals, um, how we're moving um, in response to our environment. Um, so I'm going to ask you to uh, just go ahead and stand up. We're going to do some demonstrations throughout the presentation. 
Um, so I'm going to ask you to uh, balance. So go ahead and stand up. I'm going to ask you to balance on one leg. OK, and then I'm going to ask you to balance on one leg with your eyes closed. And what you should find is you're doing some little uh, movements of your ankle. You're usually probably using an ankle strategy to maintain your, your balance. Now I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, balance on one foot, eyes open, and just turn your head from one side to the other. And you're probably finding that your, your ankle is working a little bit harder. Now do it with your eyes closed. And you might find that even you, you might even lose your balance. So um, postural stability is a major function of our vestibular system. Um, the other thing is gaze stability. So go ahead and just look at the slide. And um, you know, with the head still, it's very easy to read. And I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and turn your eye, turn your head back and forth and try to read that. So at a low frequency, maybe at about at one hertz, you should, probably shouldn't have too much trouble reading it. If you go to two hertz, it might start moving on it on you. You might get some retinal slip. That image might move off the center of your vision. And if you go beyond that, then that should be pretty indecipherable. Um, so the vestibular system allows us to keep images still, allows us to use vision, um, and kind of helps both systems kind of calibrate one another. So the pediatric vestibular system is formed. Um, there is significant development of it in the first trimester, and it is fully intact at birth. Um, however, it is poorly integrated. And we know this because we can test. So uh, some of you guys are probably familiar with the modified clinical test of sensor integration and balance. So kind of like the foam and dome. Um, when we test kids on, uh, put them on foam or have them stand with eyes closed, we know that they perform worse than older kids or adults. Um, so they're not truly using all the, all the information that it's available to them. They have difficulty integrating vestibular information. Um, however, by the time somebody is 15 or 16, their, their vestibular system should be fully integrated, meaning that they should be able to fully use that information to help with their gaze stability and their balance. So kids are going to rely heavily on vision. So the, the baby on the left there, um, let's pretend that they were standing up and they're a new, new emerging walker. If they're looking at you, you're walking down the hallway towards them and they're looking at you and then they look up. What, what usually happens is they're going to fall backwards or they at least lose their balance or their, their weight shift is going to go backwards um, because they, they are relying on static objects for vision and you are moving objects in their field of vision. Um, so what may a parent report? Um, there's lots of different symptoms. Um, covering lots of different uh, areas, um, but unfortunately, frequently the symptoms are non-specific to vestibular pathology and can overlap and um, or even indicate other areas. Um, so some of the symptoms um, might be poor balance, gross motor delays. Um, as we talked about a little bit earlier, they might have difficulty with stereoambulation. You know, at four or five years old, um, might be unwilling to jump, might be willing, unwilling to play with playground equipment. Um, but uh, other things that you, you know, might not necessarily think about, fine motor delays, uh, reading difficulty, cognitive deficits, poor visual or spatial awareness, uh, low muscle tone, headaches, clumsy, all kinds of things like that. And we'll talk later about kind of range, the rangy effects of vestibular pathology. So Lily is on the bottom there. Um, she is um, still kind of holding her arms in a high guard position. Um, at this point, um, she's having chronic ear infections. She had about seven to nine of them between the ages um, under a year old until she finally got ear tubes at three years old. Um, she did have some speech delays, um, even though she had a normal hearing test and her um, mother is a speech language pathologist. Um, she's super clingy. Um, so when she goes to even a room that she's familiar with, she tends to just kind of cling on to anybody who's near her. Um, sensory sensitive, um, especially to like uh, sounds and things like that. Um, and as she gets getting older, you know, she's four years old. When I first start talking with her uh, mother, 
about her. She's having difficulty with stairs and turn, you know, still requiring use of a railing, still going like step together, step together pattern. Um, she would use a swing um, a lot and she would put herself, um, they, they um, got a swing for her um, inside her house because that would be calming for her. Um, and she could be on a swing kind of infinitely, um, whereas some other kids might get dizzy after a while. Um, so moving on to specific symptoms of vestibular pathology in kids, really, um, there's not a lot there. Um, vertigo, certainly a subjective sensation of movement, is a specific symptom of vestibular pathology, but really a lot of kids don't report that. Um, you might see the effects of that. So, you know, a child who is motion sick isn't going to report that they have vertigo, but you might, you know, might find that, you know, they're thrown up or they're pale or, or things like that. Um, whereas kids don't necessarily report the things that an adult would with the same, uh, same issues going on. Um, or, you know, a parent might report they have poor balance with vestibular bias conditions. So again, walking in like a dark hallway, walking over um, soft ground, you know, in the dark, you know, things like that. Um, again, uh, five to six percent of kids are, are likely dizzy and only a quarter of them will see a provider for this. So what are com common uh, vestibular pathologies in kids? Um, frequently, it kind of depends on who's looking and where. We know that the frequencies of, of pediatric vestibular pathology is different than adults, um, and frequencies can also differ with age. Um, the commonly um, most common diagnosis presented in an ENT clinic are kind of from most common to least common um, um, somewhat, and it really depends on the source that you look at. But certainly head injury, concussion, um, migraine vertigo, um, benign paroxysmal vertigo of childhood. That's something that, that ends up looking a lot like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, but we know that BPPV is very uncommon in kids, where BPVC is, is more common. Um, it, pre it presents basically as acute bouts of vertigo that last seconds to minutes and can result in falling or ataxia and goes away. Um, Chronic otitis media or ear infections affects a lot of kids. You see that stat, 10% uh, of children under the year, on, under one years old, um, and that can affect both hearing and uh, vestibular function. Um, sensory nerve hearing loss is also because of, of course, the, the anatomy of the vestibular nerve is very closely tied to vestibular pathology, and that can also occur um, even in the ear that's not affected by hearing. Um, Congenital cytomegalovirus, um, tumors, um, again, we said positional vertigo, but I'm positional vertigo is less common in kids. Um, and those other things are also um, somewhat uncommon. Okay, so what else could this be? Again, talked about um, how these can all bleed in into and there's a large overlap between uh, visual and vestibular pathology. Um, we also might be looking at a somatosensory problem or a sensory problem or a motor control problem or even a problem simply in attention or behavior or um, uh, you know, preference for things. Um, those are my two kids um, on the bottom there and kids are generally curious and like to climb and move and jump and things like that and you know we're looking at how the kid is behaving as compared to their age match peers. Um, you know, so will a child attempt to do things that, you know, other children of the same age will do is an important question there. Okay, we're going to take the next five to six minutes and talk and kind of divert into pediatric vision because, again, it's so closely tied to uh, pediatric vestibular function. Um, I, re I would recommend in an exam looking at vision first. Um, so just a little bit of history. Uh, kids are born with very poor visual acuity. Um, it can be as bad as 2600 um, and 2200 is legal blindness. Um, 
but by the time a child is one year old, they should be about, they should have functional vision. They should be about 20, uh, 50. Um, and then their vision completely should completely normalize by about three years old. Vision is a primary way of collecting information about our world and guiding movement. Um, and vision is very, very connected to all sorts of processes that happen in our brain. So that, that picture on the lower left there shows the optic nerve and the tracks back to the uh, occipital region. But then you see all those pathways to um, the somatosensory uh, motor cortex um, and even some of the, um, the areas underneath, uh, like hippocampus and things like that. Um, Seeing is not enough. We also have to process that information and make sense of our world and learn about our world. Uh, a good example of that is a visual cliff, which is a looks like a very mean study. You, you put the kid on top of a visual cliff and you coax them across that and new, <laughs> new toddlers or new uh, crawlers will fall down that visual cliff because they don't really know what that information means. Or crawlers that have a little bit of experience will learn that, but again, as kids become a, a walker, they'll some for whatever reason they'll forget that and they'll also fall off the visual cliff. Um, so how do you look at vision in a pediatric patient? Um, we can look at acuity if a kid can report to you, you know, shapes, letters, directions of, uh, you know, like an E, up, down. Um, then we can assess their static visual acuity. We can also look at alignment. So simply by covering one eye and look, having asking the child to look at something. Um, so look at a toy and then I'm going to cover one eye and then uncover it and cover one eye or go back and forth. Their eyes should still be aligned right on that, that toy if they're attending to it. Um, but static, a static visual exam doesn't really give you all the information that you need. Um, really, we want to do a functional visual exam. Um, so vision, um, we, we are, again, we talked about processing information. And what we're doing when we're processing information is we're taking kind of little bites. So we look at this and we look at this and then our brain will kind of mix it together. Or we'll kind of, your brain will kind of assemble a composite uh, image. Um, and when we, we're constantly kind of scanning and moving our environment, um, looking at our environment, the, the child's um, up on, on the upper right there shows you a, a kind of visual scanning pattern. We look at when we're looking at a face, we'll look at the eyes and the nose and the mouth. We won't uh, have the same attention to like hair or cheek or things like that. Um, we can also look at um, smooth pursuit. We can have them follow a light or a toy back and forth. You can look at convergence, have them look at something that's moving close to them. Um, you know, if it, age appropriate, you can have a child do some reading and, and look at where their eyes are moving to. We know that when they're reading there, we rely on saccades to kind of chunk uh, visual information. So like chunk, 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 um, sweep, and then keep going with that. Um, We can uh, begin to address visual dysfunction, I think, in our um, treatments. Um, of course, we can't fit glasses or prisms, but we can refer them to the appropriate um, people who can. Um, we can do some visual tracking. So like a marble maze is a good example of that. Um, you know, visual tracking, we, we think of just moving our eyes, but even something as simple as reading. Um, go ahead and just, just read something on your desktop. So are you moving your head? The answer is yes. We, we know that people are, are, are moving their head. Um, so we think of reading as, as a, a primary visual task, but we are also moving our head. Um, and I think that's where what kind of ties some of the vestibular information to the ocular motor um, and can later have sequelae in terms of reading. Um, we also can do saccades. So on the lower left there, we're asking a child to copy a letter um, or you can do a symbol so they have to look up at the letter and they have to try to replicate and they're going their eyes are going back and forth. We can ask them to do conversion. So read something that's uh, close. Um, but it's a really important question. Um, yeah, I re repeatedly forget this. Um, let me pull this up. 
And the question is, what are you looking at? So you can just take a second and what I want you to do is count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Okay, um, so the first time I did that, I, I, I think I got somewhere around 15 passes. I think I got that right. Um, and if you've seen this before, you need to kind of know what I'm going to. Um, but visual attention is tremendously important. And when the first time I did this, I did not see the gorilla. It, it seems very obvious in retrospect, but you're asked to look at the players in white and there's a black gorilla that wanders through the middle of the screen and I did not see that at all and it was uh, I was floored by the fact that uh, I did not see that. So visual attention is tremendously important. It's important for us to understand what our patients are seeing and what information they're, they're gathering. Um, so let's do another one. This, it, it relates you know, more to kind of sensory processing. So I want you to stop for a second. I want you to listen to what's around you. So for example, I could hear cars outside, I could hear a train in the background, a little tinnitus. Um, but there's a lot of things that are going on that we selectively uh, exclude from our attention. It's important to understand what our kids are seeing or are not seeing. Um, so uh, other things to address visual dysfunction and it also will tie into some vestibular because we're adding in some movement to that. Um, would be like throwing and catching, popping bubbles. Uh, I, I had a child who we were doing some visual attention tasks. Um, we're in a small room, eight by 10, and he repeatedly, uh, well, a couple times before we moved him out of that area to, to a larger area, is he, he hit his head on the wall because he could not judge where the wall was in respect to uh, where his body was. Um, we sometimes can take for granted how much we rely on visual processing. Um, the example at the bottom there, um, I, I was thinking about this stuff as I was watching the national championship game. But think about like a, a quarterback in terms of the visual processing that they have to do in terms of looking at the ball, looking, knowing where their linemen are and where their defensive ends are chasing them and where the receivers and defensive backs. It's, it's an incredible amount of information that they have to process and respond to very quickly. Um, but even so, a simple task as walking and catching a ball um, requires a lot, a ton of visual processing and also some vestibular um, information. And we also know that our world, if we were to solely rely on vision, we would do somewhat poorly. So if you're sitting at a stoplight and the car um, next to you uh, moves, what do you do? You, you hit the uh, you hit the brake, and that's because that your your vision is telling you that you're moving, but in reality you're not. Um, Another example would be you're running for a fly ball. You're looking up at a ball um, against the blank sky. Um, we're looking at a moving object, so we're relying on something other than vision to help maintain our balance. Um, or even something as simple as watching television. If somebody is visually dependent, if they're not relying on somatosensory or vestibular inf information, if that screen moves, if, if that, that video camera or the camera pans, then that person's going to get a sense of movement. And that's not always good. Um, but we're going to come back from vision. We took, I think we took about eight minutes there. Um, and we're going to talk about what we can test in terms of vestibular, what kind of vestibular tests we can do within our clinic. Um, and we'll try to demo these as best we can. Um, so the first one you can do is called a head thrust. A head thrust is a test that looks at the horizontal canals and how your vestibular um, semicircle canals tie into vision. So we know that when we move our head quickly, um, our, our VOR should allow us to maintain visual fixation. So go ahead and do that. Just tuck your head down a little bit. 
and I want you to just look at an object on your screen and just turn your head relatively rapidly. Now this is a little different. You're actively doing that. Your body hypothetically could kind of feed forward and predict what you're doing there, but this is a passive test. The links are there for you to view at your own time if you're not familiar with these. So that's a head thrust test. It, asks you, it basically asks you to pull your pull the kid's eyes off the target. Um, and if you're able to do that, then we know that that, that VOR is not working properly. Um, it's not a very sensitive test um, in room light. It gets better when we use what's called the video head impulse test. Um, but something that we can do uh, in our clinics. Uh, rotary chair test. Um, so this is a really fun one, and when I discovered it um, through a through a course, I started doing that on a lot of the kids. So we have a platform swing at our at the Tillman Clinic. Um, put kids on that, and the test that the way I was taught to do that um, was turn at two turn or two seconds per turn and do fifteen times. So I'm going to ask you to do this five times. I can ask you to do this 15 times. Um, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up. And as you turn, if you're on a swivel chair, do it on a swivel chair. But if you're just standing, just do it in, or just do it in standing. That's fine. As you turn, I want you to try just allow your. Um, I'm not going to do it with the eyes closed. Going to run into something. But I want you to just try to do it without fixating your eyes on something. So you can do, even do this with your eyes open. All right, go ahead and try it. I'm going to do it and I'll look at the camera and as you can see. One, two, three, four, five. Good. And I'm not sure if you can see my eyes right now if I'm close enough, but I definitely have nystagmus because I could see the camera kind of going back and forth and I'm feeling the room being pulled in one, one way. And what, you sh what should happen with your child is you should see nystagmus. You should be doing this on both sides. If a kid doesn't have nystagmus, and that's a, a sign of a hypofunction or complete loss of vestibular information um, through that movement. Um, if you have, you can even do this in an infant if, if the parent is willing to uh, hold the kid and be turned around 15 times in a row. Or if you have a student, you can give it to them because they do better when you're younger. Um, dynamic visual acuity, we talked about this a little bit um, before or kind of demonstrate a little bit before. So using like a Snellen chart or a Logmar eye chart, um, you ask the child to read um, or describe a picture um, and then you repeat that with head movements. So there's some different um, frequencies that are suggested in the literature. The one we use for adults is frequently two hertz, so it's two turns per second. And I've also seen it at one hertz, so one turn per second. I've also seen versions where they put somebody on a treadmill and have them go at different speeds um, for dynamic visual acuity. But go ahead, go ahead and try that. Uh, just read the slide at one turn per second. You probably should be able to do this. Now try two, one, two, one, two, one, two. You might be able to do that. If you go beyond that, things should move all over on you. And that's called retinal, the retinal slip. So basically the image is moving off the central vision um, and your brain can't make sense of it um, and it needs to. Um, other things we can look at the clinical level are balance. So the vestibular input to balance um, the vestibular spinal reflex. The most common one is a modified clinical test of sensory integration and balance. So putting a kid um, from standing on a firm surface to foam, and then repeating that with eyes open and eyes closed. Um, through that uh, test, we can see how a child is using um, somatosensory information, so comparing um, both on firm and foam, and then use how they're using visual information, um, both eyes open and eyes closed. Um, of course, the condition that biases the vestibular system is eyes closed on uh, foam surface um, that asks them to attend to, to the vestibular information. Um, there are norms on adults somewhat. Um, I'm not really familiar with norms on children with that. Um, I, know, I know in a lot of clinics we have the, um, the biodex with that. Um, there's a lot of other non-specific um, balance tools. So non-specific I mean 
Um, they're going to look at other things besides the vestibular system in terms of balance, but the bot, um, Peabody sensory um, organization test, um, pediatric balance scale uh, for concussion, you can use the best test, um, just kind of informally walking and turning their head. Um, so Lily there, um, she, we did um, the, the Peabody and she had trouble with it. So going back to when she was four years old, she had a lot of trouble with balancing for the length of time that she should have been able to do that. Um, and let's move on from that. Um, so things that you cannot do within your clinic, um, but might be important in terms of diagnosing um, or kind of giving a prognosis. Um, for a child as young as um, a, a, an infant, um, they can do a rotary chair test or what's called the V-HIT test. Um, so the head impulse test, just using video, it's, it's a much more sensitive test. Um, or VEMPS. Uh, VEMP is a, it's called a vestibular evoked myogenic potential. Basically, you, you stimulate like a click or a, um, like a little sound. Um, and even though you're autoless, you, like your, your um, vestibular system is for gay stabilization and balance, historic or evolutionary, it could detect um, sound. So basically what that test is basically the, um, that pathway between the, your me the mechanicals of your vestibular system, the vestibular nerve, and it records your myogenic potentials of your SCM. Um, as you get older, um, kids can tolerate caloric testing. So caloric testing, basically putting warm or cold air in the inner ear and looking at the nystagmus that's produced and comparing it side to side to look for a hypofunction. Um, Testing ages there aren't really specific. I think if you look at different sources, uh, different sources will test different, do test at different ages there. Um, so what did we find? Um, so when we looked at some of these things, so going back to Lily, um, they had the swing at home um, and I didn't see like a video of it, um, but her mother told me when, when we did the, um, the basically the rotary chair test that she had very it was very difficult to provoke any nystagmus with her it required a, a lot and she really had a very small response to that um she had a lot of difficulty when you put her with her eyes closed or put her on a compliant surface so that suggested that she had both difficulty with both gaze and postural stability um she was also relatively motion insensitive, so she can go on the swing and she just spin and spin and spin and spin, um, and she wasn't getting too sick of that. But she also was somewhat gravitationally insecure, so she, if she went to a playground, she wouldn't want to interact all that much. Um, she wouldn't do a lot of jumping or climbing on furniture or things like that. So what can we do? Um, the three main areas, um, our substitution, adaptation, and habituation. Um, so kind of another way of explaining that would be exposure. Um, it you know, re relates to habituation, but also just kind of exposure to experiences. Um, adaptation um, involves turning your head or exposure to using vestibular bias conditions. Um, and habituation is, is trying to get somebody to respond to something less. So this would be an example of, of uh, substitution. This little boy, let's go to here. So a, a child who's uh, severely vision impaired using some medicine information in order to negotiate a curve. So it's not a child with vestibular information, but it's kind of neat. And Really cute and see be able to do that first. Okay. 
OK. So substitution, um, looking at relying on instead of this vest uh, vestibular, um, looking at relying on visual or somatosensory information. So this is something you might do if somebody had a severe loss um, that we're not expected to recover. Um, let's say they they had uh, antibiotic that that knocked out their um, vestibular system. Uh, we know that um, autotoxicity can occur in kids, um, you know, who receive certain antibiotics, certain diagnosis um, who are, are prone to that, including including like cystic fibrosis. Um, you know, we do it all the time substitution. So we're in a, in the shower. Um, we're washing our hair, we close our eyes and we put our hand on the wall because we're not, no longer using vision to tell our bodies where we are in space. You know, if a child has a severe vestibular um, loss, you know, they're going to a movie, um, you know, going up the stairs in a dark movie theater, you'd ask them to put their hand on the wall. Um, adaptation is something we probably would do more frequently. Um, so we practice that a little bit. Um, the VOR, so basically moving your head and asking them to fixate their gaze. So in a child, um, you know, you might have them look at a picture and as you're moving their head or as they're moving their head, um, ask them to describe what's on the picture or ask them to even do some reading if they're of that age. Um, we're trying to normalize the gain. So basically if their head moves a certain amount in this direction, their eyes should move a certain amount in that direction. Those should be linked. Um, doing vestibular bias conditions, um, putting them on foam um, with their eyes closed, or, or again, doing things that would break um, their ability to look at something that's uh, fixed. Um, so looking, walking and catching a moving ball, um, things of that nature. Um, again, these are some things that, you know, very adult uh, vestibular therapists are very familiar um, and just have to be adapted for um, for children to keep their interest and um, and to give them the, the proper time on task. Um, the goals of habituation are to increase response to the same stimulus. Um, so if going back and forth on a swing is just completely overwhelming, um, you know, getting the child to play a game while sitting next to the swing or getting them to sit on the swing and not even moving it. Um, would be kind of steps to getting them to be able to tolerate kind of that uh, moving back and forth. Um, intensity is really important. If we don't do enough, um, then we don't get any change. If we do too much, then we can go the opposite way. Instead of getting habituated to it, to get basically get, getting used to it, we can become sensitized to it. Um, another example would be um, that child in the middle there, um, Going down steps, if he, if the child is scared of going um, up and down like a normal six or eight inch step height, is using smaller steps or using a handhold assist, um, allowing them to improve their confidence and their kind of gravitational security. Um, and going back to our case, Lily would um, vestibular input was actually very calming for her. So when she was upset with something that might necessarily be related to vestibular. Or, you know, her schedule changed, um, you know, had a texture that she didn't like. Sometimes she can go back to the swing that they had in their home um, and that would be calming for her. So you know, keep that in mind too. Um, <laughs> and so that picture on the bottom is my uh, uh, children at Knobles Amusement Park. Um, the interesting thing about that is they could tolerate uh, this, the, that like spinning. But the one on the left there, the, the um, I think she's almost three years old in that picture. Um, you put her in a car and you had her uh, look at a program on a tablet and she threw up. Um, so, somewhat unexpected there. Um, one of the things in talking to my sister-in-law um, about Lily there, and Lily's on the right there, um, she brought up the point of positive peer pressure, which I, is a, I love that way of, of phrasing it is basically one of the things that really helped Lily. And one of the things that we frequently face is a question, you know, my child, you know, can't keep up with other people, you know, other kids in karate class or in gym or, you know, in gymnastics or things like that, you know, should I have them do that? And my answer is, is almost always yes. Um, a lot of times we're, you know, we don't know how they're going to respond and sometimes they respond very well, but sometimes kids are very motivated by what other kids can do. So Lily, for example, 
you know, had that kind of gravitational insecurity. She didn't want to um, use a lot of playground equipment, but when she saw other kids doing it, you know, she was home, she was motivated to work on it with her family to be able to do the monkey bars and things like that. You know, or her younger brother, um, who is kind of kind of completely opposite end of the movement spectrum. You know, climbs, jumps, is completely, um, you know, very secure in terms of her movement. You know, even though Lily's older than him, um, was motivated to kind of keep up with him. Um, she now, um, she's just some, nearing seven. Um, she enjoys um, dancing. Um, she still has difficulty with, you know, some sensory things like changing schedule or, um, you know, textures um, or, you know, changing schedules and things like that. She still um, does continue to either participate or consult with occupational therapy. Um, but the kind of important takeaway there is can that child participate in community activities and what can you do to support their movement towards community activities? Um, so one of the last things I want to talk about is kind of the what we call the rangey effects of vestibular pathology. Um, we know that even for adults, um, vestibular pathologies can be accompanied by and seeming can cause cognitive changes. Uh, that's something that's kind of flooring to me. Um, vestibular information is routed through the hippocampus, um, so it does have relationship with spatial memory. Um, the picture down there on the right is uh, uh, that uh, guy from Frozen is lost in the woods there, um, so difficulty navigating his environment. Um, other rangy effects, um, because the vestibular system is involved in gaze stabilization, um, it might contribute to dysfunctions with, in, or difficulty with reading. Now, now the, the next question would be, if by improving vestibular function in those kids, does that improve their ability to read? Um, I'm not sure. And by, I'm not sure, meaning I, I don't know enough about the literature or whether whether there is literature to support that or not. You know, other effects, um, it, idiopathic scoliosis is related to vestibular dysfunction, you know, is also related to torticollis. Um, there does seem to be some suggestion that uh, ADHD um, learning disorders can be related to vestibular dysfunction, but in terms of, you know, whether is it is it causal or not. Um, some populations that we definitely want to keep in mind um, for screening for vestibular pathology, those with chronic ear infections that we talked about, um, and I didn't mention before, they, they we would expect their balance to somewhat improve uh, with use of ear tubes. Um, kids with sensorineural hearing loss, cochlear implants, also just a family history of vestibular impairment, or we talked about uh, cytomegalovirus. Who else can help? Um, up there on the right there is a pediatric ophthalmologist, and down there on the lower right is a pediatric uh, ENT. Um, audiologists, other therapists, um, pediatric neurology, one thing that's really important to keep in mind if, if somebody is referred for um, ophthalmology is, is what was ophthalmologist um, looking at? Are they looking at the function of the eyes? Are they looking at how the child is moving their eyes or not? Or are they simply looking at acuity structure of their eye? Um, some questions and areas for further learning. Um, you know, I hope this is kind of like a springboard for um, you know development of you know both myself and also within the network of understanding of pediatric vestibular pathology and how that ties into um, a lot of things that we do. Um, you know, what are norms? Um, you know, what kind of effects would we expect to see with uh, vestibular dysfunction? Um, by addressing vestibular dysfunction, um, does that correct some of the other things? Is there a critical period of vestibular uh, integration? Um, so one of the scary things I came across was um, a child with a, a cataract. Um, if they had a cataract between the months of, I think it was two to six, um, they, even by the time, even at the time they were nine, they still had difficulty with facial recognition in that eye that they had a cataract. Um, so are there certain critical periods that we need to be able to integrate that, that vestibular information? Um, and then just finally, how can we learn more about pediatric vestibular dysfunction? 
Rosemary Ryan and Jennifer Braswell Christie are two really good sources. Then if you simply do a PubMed search, you'll find a lot of good articles that they've been working on. Um, VEDA, um, there's a link there. And then the ANPT Special Interest Group um, has a lot of podcasts. Um, it has a lot of information about uh, vestibular dysfunction, in mainly in adults, but again, a lot of it does apply to um, the kids. Um, there's a clinical practice guideline in vestibular hypofunction um, that would be applicable. Um, here's a bunch of references. So if you want to look a little closer about, you know, idiopathic scoliosis and uh, vestibular hypofunction, or if you want to look at, uh, you know, reading in vestibular hypofunction or vestibular pathology, then some of those uh, links can be found in those articles there. Um, but thank you for participating. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I think that the thing that we want to do is we want to get every kid be able to participate in all the areas of life that they can. Um, lots of areas of our life require um, tolerance and good functioning of our vestibular system. Um, so thanks for thanks for being here.